Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service here at Sonnenberg Mennonite Church. My name is Phil Raber, and a warm welcome to everyone if you're here in the pews or if you're watching and listening in Virginia or Pennsylvania or Hawaii. Welcome, and we're glad you're here. Although Hawaii, I might be tempted to be there as well, but anyway, if you're listening, welcome, and we call you to our time of worship here. We've been on a journey here this time, this season of Advent and Christmas, a journey and a story that we all have our own personal stories that we're going through as well. Some of us celebrating birthdays, Carolyn Zerker today, and this last week, Lucas Miller, and Dave Ross, and William Holton, and Donna Johnston's got a birthday coming up. So that's a fun time to celebrate, but we celebrate Jesus' birthday at this time of the year. Some of our stories include injuries or illnesses or diagnoses in our family members, or may, maybe saying goodbye to a family member with a funeral service. That's part of our stories. Part of the stories is the weather. If you haven't seen the weather lately, up and down, I don't know in Ohio, it's highs and lows and I don't knows, but <laughs> hang on. And also a fascinating story this last week that I just have to mention. For those folks that are sports fans, last Monday night, somebody had cardiac arrest on the football field of a pro football game. And these are three or 350 pound machines. These guys are monsters. And it's interesting how tough they are, but in a time of crisis, what happened? They all kneeled on the football field. And just last night, uh, Damar Hamlin noted, he said, when you put real love out into the world, it comes back to you three times as much. The love has been overwhelming, but I'm thankful for every single person that prayed for me and reached out. If you know me, this is only going to make me stronger. I'm on a long road. Keep praying for me. That's a good story from this last week. We've been on a story. We've been on a journey with this door over here. If you remember when we started off, it was all scuffed up, had multiple layers of paint, and we've been watching it become transformed. And now we have this beautiful color and we have this pathway that's inviting us to look at the mountain. And this mountain up here, pretty unique. And I'm going to invite you to come up at the end of the service as well. But it has a little bit of a logo theme up here to the mountains. And you'll be seeing that logo around the church as well this coming year. And down at the bottom here, we have our theme verse for 2023. So here we are, we're tying off Advent and Christmas, and we're looking forward to uh, the good news coming in 2023, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So you're going to be hearing that theme verse throughout this year. That's part of our story going forward. In that theme verse in the logo, I think you've seen that like at our congregational meeting, and there's going to be a nice write-up about all the meaning that went into the the logo and the painting in the next issue of Sojourn, so be looking for that. There is a lot going on, and you may be thinking there's a lot going on here this morning as well, and so maybe not each element grabs your attention, but I'd invite you to perhaps zero in on one or two things. So maybe it's a reading, or it's a song, or a visual, or whatever. Not everything has to have the same meaning to everyone. But may you all join in to our worship for King Jesus. And may you experience love and restoration as you participate today. We're going to have a reading. This is, comes from Psalm 80, and it's the call to worship. And I'll invite you to join in. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. 
Awaken your might. Come and save us. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Amen. And now some songs. Good morning. Please turn to 32 in your Sing the Story book, the purple book. And we're going to start off first Sunday of the new year with, or second Sunday of the new year with a beautiful star of Bethlehem. Please stand. Our next song is 214 in the blue hymnal. 
and this has a leader part and an all part. And so I'm gonna, I'll be the leader and you guys can be the all. And just a lot of good um, words um, regarding the birth of Jesus. We will wrap up our Advent story, finally. I missed seeing you all on Christmas Day. There you go. Yeah. Hello. Did everybody enjoy their Christmas? Yeah? Yes? Good. And are you happy to be back in school now? Yeah? Good. We still need to go through our Advent story, though. We need to finish it. Remember, we didn't finish the story. You guys already know the story, though, don't you? Yeah. All right, this is a different take on the story. Go ahead and open it. We're going to quickly go through the parts that we've already read. Do you remember? We've got the shepherds here just doing their thing at night, right? Keep them watch over their flocks by night. <gasps> There's the angel, surprises them, scares them, right? Tells them, you got to get up and go. There's a baby being born. It's who you all have been waiting for, right? So they get up, they go. It was smart of them to listen to the angel, wasn't it? There they go. They're bringing gifts for the baby. They're traveling. They're following that star. Do you see the star? They're following the star. Oh. They come upon somebody. They're like, hey, come with us. Come with us to Bethlehem. And this guy says, no, I can't. 
an angel came to me and said, I have to watch over this well because the Savior who is coming is going to need this water. And they're like, okay, cool. We will keep going. We wish you peace on this good night. And now they come upon somebody else. What's that guy doing? He's fishing in the middle of the night. Do you normally fish in the middle of the night? No, you don't. I don't know why you would. That would be silly. Anyway, he's fishing in the middle of the night because an angel told him to, right? He's like, I was told by an angel that the Savior who is coming will need fish. So I'm fishing. So they leave him there to keep fishing, and they're going to go on their way. And here they come across somebody in the middle of the night out there. What is he doing? He's plowing a field. He's got some very strong ox in there, and he's got a plow, and he's pushing it. He waves to him and says, I can't come with you guys. I wish I could, but an angel came to me too and said, I've got to make some wheat. I'm going to sow the wheat in this field. It's going to grow. It's going to ripen. I'm going to harvest it. I'm going to make it into flour. I'm going to make it into bread because the angel told me the Savior who is born will need it. It's going to need bread. One more group of people they come across on their way to Bethlehem to see this new baby. What are these people doing? They're picking grapes in the middle of the winter when grapes don't normally grow. But they were told also by an angel that if you go out and look at your vines, you will find grapes. You must harvest them right now. You must make them into wine because the Savior who will be born will need it. Okay, so they're harvesting the grapes. We wish you peace on this good night as they travel on. This night, this night is full of secrets, they say. In this story, they weren't the only ones to be visited by angels, were they? No. So they keep traveling. They keep following the star. It's cold out. They're going a long distance. But who else is going to see this baby that's going to be born? Who are these guys? The wise men? What are they also called? What are they also called? Magi? Yes, Eliza? They're bringing presents. They are. They have to find the king first, don't they? They're also called the three kings. The Oh, who are you? <laughs> they're the wise men, the magi, three kings, men from the east. And they're traveling very far on their camels. And their servants are kind of starting to complain. They're like, it's cold and dark. I wish we could sit by the fire and have a hot bowl of soup. When are we ever going to get there? Do they even know where we're going? Does it look like they know where they're going? They've got their maps out. They're deliberating. What are we supposed to be doing? Where are we going? And who is this person we're going to meet? They're not quite certain, are they? But they know that the world has been waiting. And now a special star has been seen. They're following that star because they have been told by prophecies from from a long, long time ago, that it will lead them to this new king, to this person the world has been waiting for. So there they are. They're going to keep going. Oh, look, here we have. We have a city in the distance. We've got shepherds walking down here. They're walking, to, following the star. We've got wise men walking over here, following the star. They're heading to the same place, aren't they? Yeah, it's true. We're not going to get to that part in this story, though. Mary and Joseph have been waiting for this night. Months before, an angel had appeared before Mary and said, Mary, blessed are you among all women, and blessed is the child you will carry, baby Jesus. Mary and Joseph knew this was a gift from God. So they had been visited from an, by an angel many months before, right? We talked about that, about how... They were Israelites, and they had been waiting with all the rest of Israel for the Savior to come, for God to send his most special gift, right? 
Let's see. So on that night, Mary and Joseph had settled into a stable where the animals made room for them. And as the kings and the shepherds hurried toward the star, a radiant light filled the stable. The animals lifted their heads at the sound of a newborn child's cry. Do they look happy, the animals? I think they look happy to be sharing their stable with the new baby. When the kings and the shepherds arrived, their hearts were so full that they forgot their hard journey. We followed the star, the shepherd boy said. We come bearing gifts, said King Melchior. Incense, myrrh, and a chest full of gold, enough for a whole kingdom. Is the baby a king or is he a shepherd, whispered the little shepherd boy. Shh, the oldest shepherd told him. Would the child like it if I played my flute for him, asked the shepherd boy. Hmm. So the boy played for the child, and the others quietly offered their gifts to him. Then an angel appeared and said, Kings and shepherds, rejoice. Let the whole world rejoice. And far away, the man watched the well. The fishermen fished, the plowman sowed, and the man and the woman aged the wine. For the time would come when Jesus would need water and fish and bread and wine. Water to cleanse the souls of the weary, fish to multiply to feed the many, and bread to break with the wine on another night of miracles. But on that night, those who could not follow the star remembered the words of the angels. Let the world rejoice. Let the whole world rejoice. And that is what the world is doing now, right? Now that we have received God's greatest gift, Jesus, we can rejoice. And we can continue to prepare just like, just like the fishermen did and the guy in the field. And they were making wine. They were still preparing, weren't they? Can we do that too? Can we keep preparing for when Jesus comes back? That's awesome. Yes, Karis? Yeah, I know. This story kind of condenses it all, huh? Yeah. Thank you guys for listening to the story. You can go on back to your seats now. I was kind of struck by how many dark pictures there were in the story time there. If you were following a story, that means you'd be traveling at night quite a bit. This is the story of the Magi from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he, called to, when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by Nif by a different route.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. For seven weeks, we've been on this journey of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. And I believe each year I grow more in my understanding, and I believe this is probably the way for most of us, of what Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany mean. Growing up, I was not familiar with these words. It wasn't until probably after college when I came back to my home congregation, was on the worship committee, and realized, oh, there's a season of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. Well, what does that mean? And then learning about the battle of Advent between song leaders, can we sing Christmas songs or not during Advent? And then Christmas, and then Epiphany, and I think Coralie mentioned last week something about there being 12 days of Christmas. Did you know that there's 12 days of Christmas that start on Christmas, go 12 days, and then after that, January 6th is Epiphany. So Thursday, January 6th, is Epiphany. And then the Sunday, somewhere in between there, is the Sunday that we celebrate Epiphany. And today, we celebrate Epiphany. What is Epiphany? Do you know what Epiphany is? Why do we celebrate it? You've probably heard of the word in Epiphany or a Revelation. I think I've shared the one epiphany that I had in my life. Didn't I share this before when I was driving tractor? We started after midnight, and because it was Sunday, so we waited till midnight. It was going to rain. We had to get the field in. My brother told me to go in and sleep, and it was that time at like 3 or 4 in the morning when I realized that I couldn't be passionate about teaching middle school math, and it was though God asked, what is it you could be passionate about teaching and the epiphany that I experienced was teaching the Bible. So it was this revealing of God's will in my life. That was my epiphany. Have you experienced an epiphany? Have you experienced a revelation? What is epiphany? And why are we celebrating it? I'll explain more later, but in a nutshell, God's restoration is for the whole world. This theme that we've been on for seven weeks of God's restoration is near, with the door that we've been following, this journey that we've been on, this idea of restoration and revelation, that it's not just for us, but for the whole world. This has been a full week this past week. We had Alexis's memorial here. And a few things from that very meaningful time of sharing stories. Uh, there was some really meaningful sharing that happened during the service as well. Ken's words that were shared. The uh, Sunday school class where Barb and Kathy and Joanna and Angela shared. And also Sarah's husband Sunday also shared. Uh, the time when he was in Africa, when Sarah went to Africa, I believe she went to Nigeria and met Sonny, and Lexi became aware of this relationship, and Sonny read for us a few emails of Lexi's recognition of his interest, and she wanted to know what his interests were in her daughter as this protective daughter, protective sister, I mean. And then the other thing that Sunday shared was when Alexis then said, all right, well, then I will forever call you Zimbabwe Mufasa. And we were, it was hilarious. Uh, Lexi, or Sonny's like, first of all, I'm from Nigeria. Uh, Zimbabwe is nowhere close. And, and besides, I'd rather be called Simba, Simba, because he lived. But Sonny probably had us laughing the most with this Zimbabwe Mufasa that whenever you see him, you'll probably think of this from now on of Lexi wanting to call him that in only a way Lexi can. And then also having us laugh, he also then said that we will miss you, Lexi, at the end, and probably had us tear up more than anything in the service. So Lexi will be missed, and it was a meaningful service that we had. Monday night after pastoral team, I get back to my office at 9.30, and I have this message that says that Benjamin Geyser passed away. And I didn't know who Benjamin Geyser was, and I looked in the back of our directory, and he is a member here, and a lot of you probably know who Ben Geyser is, and Terry and 
Charlie, I talked with Charlie on the phone, they are, uh, we are planning to have a memorial service for Ben here um, Saturday the 28th at the end of this month. So it was also our missions weekend. We're not sure if we're going to keep missions weekend that same time or if that will get pushed back. Also visited Belvia Han uh, yesterday and with Virginia and Corrine. And many of you may not know that Belvia has been suffering from dementia and is really, the last three months, it's really taken a toll. And so it was a pleasure to meet her. She really doesn't remember about much at all anymore. She was as pleasant as could be with a smile. But uh, the hospice is being called in for Belvia as well. Update on my dad. Uh, he has had optimistic news from the doctors. However, he continues to decline. Um, and not wanting to eat, I just got a message from my brothers seeing that they're taking him to the ER this morning um, because of his, his pain is being remedied, but he's also not eating, and that's causing some complications. So we're not sure what is, what's uh, in store for him in the next days and weeks. Next week, Greg Stefan will be sharing a message on baptism. Following that, um, on the 22nd, we're talking about membership and communion. And uh, like I explained how I'm growing in my understanding each year of, of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany, communion is also something that has been this mystery that I have appreciated and look forward to sharing together as a congregation for the first time that I'll be a part of with you all on the 22nd. So I'm looking forward to that. This week we are starting with Winter Wednesdays and Men's Breakfast is beginning and a lot of things are happening here in the month of January. Also, the Chosen episodes are being released. So another one tonight, I believe it's episode five. Like Phil said, this morning a lot is going on. This month a lot is going on. Two things are my focus this morning. The first is this Magi passage. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. The, va- the Magi visit the Messiah. It feels out of order since we looked last week at the flight to Egypt and the weeping in Ramah with the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. But in Matthew, we see hope mixed with sorrow. But in the overarching story of the gospel, the sorrow ends in restoration, when Jesus becomes king of all. How many of you see, have seen the movie The Nativity Story? Raise your hand. I'm just with curious. The Nativity Story. It's this, this depiction of the nativity, and it follows the storyline of these three wise men. And I've always enjoyed the way this story has, has depicted what their journey was like. So we have these three guys, Melchior, Gaspar, and I can't remember na- the name of the other king. Balthazar, thank you. They're depicted as wise men, as these astronomy, astrology experts. Those would have been combined in, the, in ancient times. And the Jews at the time, as even us today, we look at astrologers as like, that eh, doesn't seem very Christian-like, it is very pagan, but that's kind of the point in this story. Who are these three wise men, and how did they know what was going on? How could they, by looking at the skies and the heavens and seeing the, or- the formation of the stars have it being revealed that the divinity was coming to earth. Somehow, in the stars, they could tell that this was happening? There's this wonderful mystery in this story. And in the Nativity story, the movie, it's pretty, pretty quite funny how they're reluctant. The one guy is like, we've got to go. The one guy is like, there's no way I'm going. And decides last minute to come along. And they have their quirky personalities. But the part that is most moving to me is all along when they get to the end and they come and they share their gifts. And in awe, especially the one that didn't want to come, 
he is just moved beyond words at the significance, for me, it's the significance of his gift that he lays at Jesus at the manger. They bring these gifts worthy of kings. They had to have been likely very wealthy to be able to make this journey from so far away as my daughter pointed out, oh, it would have been later in the story. And they bring these gifts and they set them down, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it's the last guy that brings and sets down myrrh and says, for thy sacrifice. And he's just in awe, just stupefied awe at what is happening here. He didn't want to come along on the first part. And then he's setting this gift down. Did he know what this meant? Did he know, why was he giving myrrh? Is this embalming, you know, incense for thy sacrifice? The significance of these gifts were so profound that these three wise men that came from so far away, because they saw in the heavens that the king of kings was being born on earth, we mentioned last week that they showed up, we talked about Herod and how the angel, you know, comes to them in a dream and tells them not to go back to Herod. Herod, the ruthless ruler who murdered his wife, his three sons, his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, and an uncle, and many others, when he suspected treachery, plus all the baby boys in Bethlehem, all because he's worried about losing his throne and the Magi show up and say, where's this king of kings that was born of the Jews? Well, that's the wrong guy to tell or to ask, but they knew the prophecies foretold he'd be born in Bethlehem. There's also this parallel with the wise men of Christ a wise king traveling from afar to bring the gift of light and life. Some say that the star was, it wasn't the right timing for it to be like Halley's Comet, which comes regularly. Some say that Jupiter was known as the royal or kingly planet, Actually, I got this from N.T. Wright in my one commentary for everyone. And that the, it's Saturn was sometimes thought to represent the Jews. So, it could have been this aligning of Jupiter and Saturn that came together to form this star of Bethlehem that then moved in a way... Probably, I hadn't thought of during the night, most of their travel would have been easier to follow unless it was bright enough to see during the day. Was it an angel? How did they get to Jerusalem and then have it move over Bethlehem and then come to the house where the child is? No longer the manger in a stable, but a house. So it does make sense that it was a little bit older, only for then, you know, when Mary and Joseph had to flee and for Herod to kill all the baby boys two years and younger. How did this star guide them there? But that is this epiphany. This epiphany of what just transpired. The world receives its greatest gift in the form of God being made flesh, coming to earth, and not just for the Jews or those that Jesus was then among, but these pagan men from way far off also know that this is the king of kings for the entire world. That's the epiphany. That the divine has come to earth and is not just for those of us that know him, but it's for everyone. The greatest epiphany ever. Jesus is the King of Kings for the entire world. That's the epiphany. Isaiah 60, 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, 
and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For the darkness shall cover the earth and the thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. They shall, then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba, shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Where is God already at work in our community and outside of our church? Who are the wise people like the Magi around us who are already witnessing to the divinity of Jesus in their own ways? I think I may be most guilty of wanting to think about who's in. Who already knows Jesus? As a pastor, I show up and I want to know who's my flock and who am I responsible for and who do I have to care for? I did yes and rad and focused on evangelism, but as a pastor, I feel my responsibility of caring for the flock. But I loved this one friend of mine from Germany who said, my role isn't to just coddle my flock, but it's to kick them in the pants and tell them to get out there and do what you're supposed to do. So I kind of see that as my role. I'm, I'm caring for our flock, but I'm calling each one of you to do what you're supposed to do. And this idea of this epiphany is like not just self-centered, focused on who we are as a church and what we can grow in our ministries, but who's out there already doing stuff that we can join. That's still also mission-focused, outreach-focused, evangelism. Who can we draw in and who can we share the good news? But it's this opening of our eyes to see that there are others that are already worshiping the king, and it's maybe not in the ways that we are familiar with. How are we seeing the many ways and the people around us are already acknowledging the King of Kings? Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. Paul talks about this in the ministry to the Gentiles. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you and how the ministry was made known to be to me by revelation. As I wrote down in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. Where are you searching for wisdom in your life? Or in the life of our congregation?
What does it mean that the mystery of Christ is the wisdom of God? This leads us to the second part that I wanted to share this morning, and it's this revealing of our scriptural theme for the year. I appreciate how our church positions start in September, and we all kind of get situated into our roles, including even pastoral team, and then we take this fall season to discern what is our scriptural theme going to be for this next year, and it often starts right around the first of the year. Thinking about this next year and what all it may contain, how is God leading us? What all might, be, might we be faced with? Good things or challenging times? As we met his pastoral team and discerned what God was calling us to for a scriptural theme, the scripture that, that seemed to rise was this Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. When we started planning for Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany, Phil and Michelle, who are also on the pastoral team, when we looked at this theme for these seven weeks laid out in the leader, we were taken by, one, how the seventh week was the manifold wisdom of God. Thinking about relying on God's wisdom and not our own seemed to tie so well into the scriptural theme that we wanted to reveal at the end of this time. The church logo being revealed this year was thought about long this past year, kind of revealed at at the business meeting. We're seeing more of it now. It was on our bulletin the last Sunday. In the image here that is being restored in our door restoration, this door is going to serve as an Ebenezer for us throughout this whole year. And I loved when we met to plan, Michelle had this idea of an Ebenezer. And she didn't see that it was also an idea In the leader, I couldn't believe she had thought of this idea before she'd seen that it was an idea. I was like, great idea. So we're planning on having this be somewhere in the the church as an Ebenezer that we raise up. If you don't know what an Ebenezer is, it's a stone that's usually raised up as a reminder. And they talked about some churches do this at the beginning of the year. They bring a stone and they set it up. Well, this door is going to be our Ebenezer for the year, reminding of us, reminding us of this journey that we're on, and we have this path that's headed back to this Sun Mountains, which Sunnenberg means, that will be explained even more in the development of this logo, but it's beautifully depicted in this restoration painting of our door with our scripture also at the bottom of it. When you think of a door there's also this threshold that you often cross over as you go through it. And I'm reminded of Chronicles of Narnia in the last battle, that door that appears, that's the stable, and then it enters into heaven. But thinking of a threshold here, as we cross through this, there's uncertainty as you cross over a threshold. But trusting in God's plan for us as a congregation, individually, as a congregation, as a church, the uncertainty that we do not know what this year entails. But we are being called to lean not on our own understanding, but to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. We acknowledge God in all of our ways, and what will happen? He will direct our paths. Come what may. The last thing I want to point out is ask you to turn in your blue Mennonite or blue worship hymnal to number 603. It's the song that we've been singing every week so far during this season. We first discovered this in this hymnal and found that this tune is not very easy to sing, so we've been singing the tune from Voices Together 
But these lyrics are what had been so meaningful, thinking about this whole seven-week season and also not only this past year, but the, uh, the year coming up. I want to simply read through the verses and in light of everything that's been said, point out as you come to your own revelation of what the significance of these lines And then we will sing it one more time as a congregation. So I'm just going to read it and you can follow along. But then remember, when we do sing it, we aren't singing this tune. It'll be a projected and it'll be from the Voices Together tune. But listen to these lyrics. Sometimes a light surprises the child of God who sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain. To cheer it after rain. In holy contemplation, we sweetly then pursue the theme of God's salvation and find it ever new. Set free from present sorrow, we cheerfully can say, let the unknown tomorrow bring with it what it may. Bring with it what it may. It can bring with it nothing, but he will bear us through. Who gives the lilies clothing will clothe his people too. Beneath the spreading heavens, no creature but is fed, And he who feeds the ravens will give his children bread. Will give his children bread. Though vine and fig tree neither their wanted fruit should bear, though all the fields should wither, nor flocks nor herds be there, yet God the same abiding, his praise shall tune my voice, for while in him confiding, I cannot but rejoice. I cannot but rejoice. And now we'll sing it in response. Thank you. 